what goes on i want to welcome you to from half court for today wednesday november 6 2024 post election day troy they said it wasn't going to happen but the sun rose up or at least i'm assuming the sun's going to rise tomorrow I, I think the world won't end tonight but troy it's good to see you i am i am sean murphy alongside my dear friend troy sergey and troy you had a pretty interesting experience at, at the ballot box today didn't you i sure did sean i had uh hot and WNBA basketball Hall of Famer Tamika Catchings, uh, four-time uh, Olympic Olympian, um, retired by the Indiana Fever number, uh, one of the all-time greats as my voting clerk. Uh, absolutely incredible. Did not expect to see her there. Uh, she pointed to uh, what uh, ballot box to vote in, and afterwards she took the picture of my wife and I uh, at the ballot ballot box and then uh, we got a selfie with her so we have a picture of just my wife and i but knowing tamika catchings took the photo now that's pretty cool the fact that tamika catchings was like yeah i'll take that photo is just insane to me that is awesome but yeah actually she said can i take a photo of you guys or would you guys like a photo together so she was the one that oh wow yeah yeah oh wow that's that's awesome i mean that that's insanely cool do you just imagine if you just like like showed up at, to like a voting place and all of a sudden Zydrudis Ilgalskis was sitting there like, hello, register here, grab ballot there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an image that, that makes me laugh really hard. One but, um, can only dream, Sean. One can only dream. Exactly. But you you got to live out a very close reality. Not quite Zydrudis Ilgalskis, <laughs> but Tamika Catchings yes. will do. Yes, but Troy, we we have a lot to talk about. The Pistons are winners of two games in a row. They beat the Los Angeles Lakers and got their third win a lot sooner this year than they did last year. A little quick trivia question, Troy. Do you do you know what day the Pistons got their third win of the season last year? I do, Sean. That would have been in January, right? It was December 30th. Oh, these 30th. So very close. Very close. Yeah. Against the yep. Raptors, right? To break the yep. losing streak. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's correct. So in, in the year of 2024, they won their third game on November 4th in 2023. They won it December 30th. So a lot to discuss there. Also want to talk a little bit as well as some things going on throughout the league, how much uh, you know, the, the Milwaukee Bucks have to be in fear right now of where they're at. The, the Denver Nuggets, some injury news there. But first, this is from Half Court, where each and every week, Troy and I talk all things Pistons and NBA basketball. If you like that, be sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell so you're not missing any of the content that is coming your way. But also, if you want to make sure you're getting all the latest updates on the Pistons, everything going on with Detroit basketball, be sure you follow me on Twitter at sean half court and if you want to follow someone for fun catch photos like jimmy like tamika catchings at the at the voting booth follow troy at troy sergey 44 also likes to throw out some occasional nba takes there as well so always a, a, whatever troy tweets it's a rare occasion but it's always a sight to behold i'm due for one sean i'm due for a bold statement you are you're due for one like you'll just uh, all of a sudden it's gonna be like i'll say it lebron james is good at basketball like Troy, don't blow up the internet here, man. <laughs> but Troy, let, let's get into it, man. The the Pistons had a really big win, in particular yesterday at the Little Caesars Arena against JJ Redick, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and the Los Angeles Lakers. They moved to three and five on the season. If the playoffs were to start uh, eight games in instead of eighty two games in. The Pistons would be a playing team as of right now. They are currently, as of today, uh, ranked above the Philadelphia 76ers and Milwaukee Bucks, mm -hmm. which we will be getting to those to both of those teams here shortly. But Troy, as we mentioned, this team got to three wins a lot sooner. They went they they won two games in a row against Brooklyn and Los Angeles. What's the difference between this team in last year is just from just from your perspective you know just like obviously you know we know how much of an impact the veterans have you know things like that but you know basketball wise like you know what 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 seems different to you about this group 
that's allowing this team to close out and, and play better basketball. Yeah, I'll state the obvious first. I think a new coaching staff certainly uh, changes a lot of your team chemistry. And secondly, I just feel like two players in particular, and we've talked about them so much, but Jaden Ivey and Cade Cunningham really truly know how to be a scoring threat in the league. And I mean, yep. Ivy put up 26 last night and, and at times it went unnoticed. Uh, I mean, he yeah. just put, he, he, he looked like a vet out there. And, uh, you know, obviously we know what we're going to get out of Cade and Jalen Duran too. We know we had a rough start to the year, but he's had some decent games the last two, at least against Brooklyn and against LA. So, you know, him being on, you know, all cylinders and it just seems like they are comfortable on the court. And last yep. year there was some lineups that were put out there that it just didn't seem natural. It didn't seem like they were comfortable playing together at times, but you know, we know, we know everything with Ivy, but I mean, I, I really think Ivy is a, is a really key part that we didn't see a lot out of last Last year because of uh hashtag free ivy right uh you know yep. with um coach monty williams there kind of locking him up at times and you know not having him consistently on the court to start the games in, in the starting five so i i think him being able to score naturally for me is the big take yeah i i i absolutely agree with you you know if you know i've, I've said it every episode of this podcast and i'll say it again here Jaden ivy is is for sure the most improved piston thus far this season. And in my opinion, should be in the early runnings for most improved player. I know Kate Cunningham was actually one of the, what was one of the uh, candidates for that as well. And I think you could certainly make an argument there, but I mean, Cade, Cade for, uh, for the most part has been doing a lot of what we've seen, you know, before, but now he's just doing it every single night. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the thing that you like, like you said, the thing that, you know, really stood out to me, like, you know, the, the 26 points against the Lakers, it's the, it's the, it's the selection of shots that he's taking. He's, he's not just chucking up a ton of threes for the sake of chucking up. Like he only shot two threes last night. And the one that he hit was the most important three of the game. It was the dagger that mm -hmm. put them out of reach. And yep. it, it was the, it was the ultimate exhibit of why a K Cunningham and Jaden Ivey backport backcourt has so much potential is because of the fact that, you know, LeBron made a business, made a decision. He doubled up on Cade on that three point shot, which gave the window for Jaden Ivy to take it right from the top of the key, nothing but net. And, you know, you just saw, you know, throughout the rest of, you know, like Cade Cunningham, you know, just to talk about, you know, the scoring is obviously something that we all, you know, we all know that he can do it at, at a comfortable level, you know, even just, you know, the, the thing that's underrated about Cade is just, you know, his strength. We talk about, you know, just like his ability to get to any spot that he wants, but like he's, he can even bang around guys like Rui Hachimura, which is like one of the most stout, you know, like just, just one of the stronger wings just from like a physicality standpoint, the link he, he, he was, but he was bumping around like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, he, he got his third triple double, uh, a, as a piston, one of six pistons ever to do that. And uh, the the only player to score as much as he has and to get to a trip get uh, triple doubles as quickly as he has, by the way, Luka Doncic and Oscar Robertson. So pretty pretty pretty, pretty good company. Uh, but you know, it's just the it's just the all around complimentary game that that Cade played. You know, obviously the assists you know are, are crucial, but you know to me like the defense that he's playing, like he 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 played really good defensively against LeBron James last night. As good as you can probably play against LeBron James. Even at 39 years old, we all know LeBron James is a top 10, top 15 player in the world. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I just, when you look at the the totality of the performance, you know, like we, we've we've talked about Tobias Harris and in a shooting woes. And listen, while that's still not quite, you know, where it needs to be, the thing that's been impressive to me about Tobias is he's still managing to get 15, 18 points a night out of just good looks, smart play, taking advantage of mismatches in the paint. And he's still really comfortable with the mid range jumper. So to me, I don't think there, I don't see a reason why his three point shot won't eventually come along, but even if it doesn't, if he can, if he can continue to still play like this without the three point shot, that's still a pretty effective player. 
Of course, of course, absolutely. And um, just kind of backtracking a little bit, you know, when you were talking about Cade, I mean, he is the difference maker because we look at how deep the league is right now and you need guys like him to perform. And uh, obviously we know the triple-double is, uh, is a statistic that um, is hard to do in the, in the modern day NBA, but, you know, we really need that. And yeah, to your point, you know, the, certainly the outside touch hasn't been falling so much, um, but I, able to find, you know, scoring options. Um, elsewhere so I, th I think that's something that as a Pistons fan you have to be happy about yeah for sure I mean he's it, it's not like a situation where he's not contributing where he's not productive like that that's not the case he's rebounding well mm -hmm. he's defending well he's you know he there's even nights where you know like in, in Brooklyn he had six assists like he he's finding you know his he's fine he's putting his imprint on the game in other areas and what makes, you know, like to your point, what makes, you know, like a triple double like that so impressive? Like we've seen a lot of, in my opinion, pretty empty triple doubles, you know, over the last couple of years, not to name names, Russell, Russell Westbrook, Westbrook, but not to name any names. Uh, <laughs> uh, but with, with, you know, with, with the type of triple double that K got, you know, with the, with the 11 rebounds and the 11 assists and on top of the 19 points, like he was, he was involved in every single aspect of the game and he was thriving in all of them. So I think Cade might have had, I mean, I think Jaden Ivey was probably, you know, the player of the game, but Cade was probably the best player on the court. Right. If that right. makes any sense. No, it definitely does. And you're right. There is the kind of that balance that, you know, we have to look at with statistics, right? We can put up great numbers. Great numbers yep. are good, but great numbers can, you know, be misleading. But then you have to watch the impact packed and the fingerprints on the game. I mean, we as Pistons fans yep. know there were many games uh, throughout the years where Andre Drummond uh, had some of the best stats that big men were putting up in the 2016, 17, 18 season. But my goodness, Sean, there wasn't a lot of impact on the game as, and we'd lose a lot of games. And some of the reasons we would lose were because of him on the defensive end. Yeah. So, you know, but we have a guy that has, he plays winning basketball. Right. right. I mean, and that is exactly what you want from him. You know, well, looking at, I mean, let's put it this way. Yeah. If you're to just go by basketball reference in their stat sheet, Carl <laughs> Anthony Towns would probably be the greatest NBA player of all time. Like if you're just going solely off a of box score, we'd be going, why is cat not the greatest player in the league? Like just because you, you could see the shooting numbers is, is rebounding. A lot of that stuff, like his high points per game totals. It's like, man, cat's insane. When you actually watch him, Cat's a good player. Don't get me wrong, but there's levels to this. Yeah, and I was going to say only someone who's watching the games can can figure that out. So, <laughs> yep, for sure. And you know, I and and I still think you know, like you you still want more as far as you know contributions go from guys you know like Simone Fontecchio. You know, I think a lot of that is just him coming back from you know didn't really get to play a lot this summer. You know, was was uh, had surgery and 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 came back from rehab. So. You know, he, he's a he's a pro, even though it's only his third year in the NBA. He's been a pro in basketball for like nine, 10 years. So I have I have confidence that he's going to be able to get that, you know, get that figured out. Ron Holland it continues to impress for me, Troy. Uh, it's it's the fact that, you know, the, the, the things that you want to see from a rookie are. Can he can he play a role? Does he know the game? And is he playing with confidence? And. The confidence piece, he's passing with flying colors. Absolutely. There was a, there was that take that he had against Anthony Davis late in the game where he drew a foul and was able to get to the free throw line. He was not going to draw a foul. He was trying to posterize Anthony Davis. And you need that kind of confidence when you're coming into the league, when you're go up, going up against those types of guys. I mean, Anthony Davis is one of the best defensive players this game's perhaps ever seen. So, you know, that to, to have that level of confidence. But also, he's fitting into a role. He's doing a lot of the little things. Even if his shot isn't falling, he's really effective at driving to the basket and doing so at opportune times. So, and, and the other thing as well is, you know, he had the two steals against the Lakers as well. He's showing that he's a pest on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, when he's not fouling, he is a, he is a really stout, you know, defensive player with a lot of upside on that side of the field. So for me, for me on that side of the court, sorry. Mm -hmm. Football trade deadline day. So that stuff's on, on one of my screen, uh, all over one of my screens unintentionally. But Troy, ultimately, the point is the guy can ball. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm so glad you touched on the confidence piece because we have seen Pistons rookies throughout the year who have been put in roles that they probably shouldn't have been in as a rookie. And I, I think what's nice about this Ron Holland role is, you know, we're not playing him 30, 35 minutes a night at all. You know, we're, we're very <laughs> much letting him ease into the game, playing at his own pace. But his own pace is competitive basketball on both ends of the court. And, yep. you know, he – yeah, I, I was going to bring up that of, you know, trying to posterize Anthony Davis. Not many players his age, so fresh in the league, under 10 games in the league, would feel comfortable trying to make that play uh, in in a season and in a game where you are really trying to, to close it out and win that basketball game. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to like about him. And as far as the shooting goes, too, you know, I think we knew that that would be somewhat of a struggle going into the year. But I have a lot of confidence with him moving forward that's going to develop, just like in Asar Thompson. I mean, those are guys that that is a part of their game that will develop. And everything else that you could be concerned about isn't a concern um, because of, again, that confidence and that athletic ability to uh to feel comfortable out there. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you know, the fact that he, he only has to play, like you said, like 15, 20 minutes a night, he might only be like 15 to 20 minutes a night, but all 15 to 20 of those minutes are going to be filled with energy are going to, you know, he's going to play his ass off. He's going to be an absolute pest. And you know, a lot of the, a lot of the things around the edges, we'll see that get worked out over time. I think, you know, like people are talking about with Jaden Ivey, his jump shot, you know, like uh, they're they're bringing up like and praising, you know, like the work that Fred Vinson has done thus far in Detroit. I don't want to take credit away from a Fred Vinson because I certainly I, I certainly don't think he's had zero impact. But I mean, let's 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 just be realistic about something here, Troy. They like Fred Vinson didn't really get around these guys on a on a consistent basis until the middle or end of September, which means and, they're in work. Right, exactly. Like Jaden Ivey, this is a guy that works his absolute behind off. I talk about this at nauseum on this podcast. And so, you know, like not to say that, like, you know, I, in, in my opinion, I think when you're going to see the, the real impact of, of a Fred Vinson is in, is in January, in February, in March, it's going to be looking at a lot of these young players and see how their shooting percentages evolve over the course of the season. It's not just something where you just put him around a shooting coach for a month and a half and all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, he fixed his jump shot. That's something you have to work at every single day. So for Jay Nivey, like, like his, like, I, I just really think, you know, as much as people want to, you know, highlight that and absolutely that is a piece of why to be hopeful for the development of these players. I think it's also, you got to give credit to, to the player first, especially when those time when the, when the math just doesn't math, Troy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. And I think the off season is the time to experiment with different things such as form. You know, uh, form is a huge part of shooting. Uh, I was a former player. That is everything. And, uh, you know, the off season is a time to do that. And um, I mean, even guys like Steph Curry talk about some summers in their high school seasons back when they when they changed form and just how it expanded and opened up a different part of their game. So you hope these guys are 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 doing that. And, you know, with a guy like Jaden Ivey, you absolutely are. So. Right. And, you know, even if they can't work on like, you know, like make sweeping changes on their form during the season, like they could still work on their mechanics. They can still work on repetition and, you know, like just getting a lot of those pieces down. I think also, you know, just looking at, you know, other other guys on, on throughout the league and, you know, just how how they shoot quality three point shots. I know with how I know that this is just a league where we're just shooting as many threes as humanly possible right now, which. I mean, that's a that's a whole other conversation. I mean, in my opinion, I just don't see why the Pistons sh in their current state should be taking 34 threes in a game. That's just where the NBA is now. But, you know, I still think the biggest thing, like the, the teams that shoot the best from three, it's not just, you know, it's not just firing aimlessly. It's getting it to the right players in the right place, shooting at the right time. And I think that's another thing that this Pistons group is getting better at, which is making the extra pass, moving the basketball. A lot of times last year, especially when things started getting ugly, it would just be my turn, your turn. Let me take, let me try and take over. Let me save this game. And that's just how the hole gets even, even deeper. So, um, you know, I think that's, you know, when you just talk about where you can really see 
the impact of a JB Bicker staff and a coaching staff that's far. Bingo. I think it's really in the poise that this group has shown to be able to finish out games. And even when they do fall behind against some of these, you know, juggernauts, they're still making it competitive and keeping it close. That's where the impact is, especially like eight games in. Right, right. You're absolutely right. And I just want to credit Coach Bickerstaff with the lineups too. I, I think he is mm -hmm. very, very intentional of putting out great lineups that work together, that gel together. I think the obvious one, man, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but Kate and Ivy together. I, I think you pointed out last podcast a statistic of how, what percentage of the time are they on the court together? Uh, so, so the, this, so it's, it's not necessarily on the court together. Cade and Ivy are both on the court 90, like uh, 97 and a half percent of the time. Gotcha, gotcha, so yeah. that means one or the other is on the court for that, for that much of the game. Whereas last season, it was only 77% of the time. Bingo, so the fact bingo. that, you know, even though we have like a shortage in that, in that point guard rotation, we're not just playing Marcus Sasser because he's on the roster right. and he's a draft pick. We're playing the guys that give us a best chance to win. And I think the fact that, you know, even, even just outside of that, like they've had, they've had Tobias play the five quite a bit. If Duran's not playing well, they're quick to put in Isaiah Stewart. Like they are, they are experimenting with a lot of different things. And, you know, I think, I think, especially when you have a team that was struggling, the last thing you want to see is a coach that's stuck in their ways. Right, right. And can we talk about one of the players you just mentioned right there, Isaiah Stewart? He's been playing some pretty good basketball for our squad lately. Uh, he's able to really, really, I think, grab some rebounds, block some shots, but also score down low. And we, we, we've, we've seen that part of Isaiah Stewart for the past few years. So that's not a surprise. But I just see a, a, an even more relaxed, comfortable, consistent role already this season, you know, mm -hmm. less than 10 games in from, from Isaiah Stewart. Uh, has yeah. that been your assessment so far as well? Without a doubt. I think the biggest thing I see with Isaiah Stewart is, and, and I think you mentioned it, the role. Mm -hmm. There's clarity in his role. And it's not only clarity in what his role is, it's a role that's natural for him. And it's a role that puts him in the best position to succeed. Isaiah Stewart, you know, you, you could probably still make an argument. He's one of the five best players on this team. That doesn't mean he has to be in the starting five. I think we get so caught up in that all the time. And, you know, I, I, I and if if Jalen Duran doesn't see, you know, massive improvements, there is a world where you can maybe start Isaiah Stewart. But nonetheless, like he his his ability to play the five and, you know, it's not to compare him to Ben Wallace, but, you know, it's a very similar effect of he's still, you know, able to effectively, you know, protect the rim and be a force that deters shots. And he's playing, you know, really good basketball. You know, like he's a lot of times when the Pistons are going on runs, when they are playing, you know, at an elevated level it's when he's on the court. And, you know, I think a lot of the struggles that we have seen from Isaiah Stewart over the years, like obviously, you know, the, the first couple of years, I mean, it was just getting accustomed to the league, right? Like he was just a, like a workhorse, but he would make mistakes. He was young. Whereas now I think you're seeing a guy who's more seasoned, who knows, you know, like what he is, but also what he isn't. And, you know, even though we've seen Isaiah Stewart, like, you know, be able to showcase some shooting, like, you know, the, the truth of the matter is he's a guy that you just want down below the post being physical as all get out, making life uncomfortable for the, for the other bigs on both sides. And I think that's exactly what he's done for this team. And so, you know, he, he gives you stability and especially like, you know, when, when Jalen Duran is playing well, it essentially means you're getting high quality starting center minutes at all 48 minutes. Right, right. You're absolutely right. And um, yeah, you mentioned role. And I think that's going to be the big thing with him moving forward. And uh, you're right. I, I think being able to come in for Duran when the, you know, the fouls, when he's in foul trouble as well. Uh, but also, I think, you know, he, he adds an energy to Duran that we don't see all the time from Duran, right? We, he adds a consistent mm -hmm. energy that uh, I, I think Duran lacks at times. So to have that guy come off your bench, very valuable, yep. very valuable. And you also have to remember, too, that, you know, sometimes when Isaiah Stewart comes in, it's sometimes against the other team's second strings, right? I would say actually more more than 50% yep. of the time. So I guess not saying that those are weaker NBA players because they're still NBA players, but you get my point of I, I think if he's one of the best bigs on the court at, at that particular moment, that just helps your basketball team. Yeah, it allows them to feed even easier, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I think the 
I mean, you're even seeing him like, you know, obviously you struggle, you're going to, you're going to struggle when you're an undersized big having to go up against an Anthony Davis. Right. But no you know, you saw him even making plays against a LeBron last night. You know, you, you, you saw him being, being disciplined and you know, it's, it's interesting. Like he, uh, you know, Isaiah Stewart was the one that actually ended up with more, with more playing time than Jalen Duran. And a big part of that is just the fouling. I mean, uh, Duran had five fouls in yesterday's contest, you know, and, and, and listen over the last, over the last couple of games, I think you are starting to see more of the Jalen Duran of old. Like he is starting to rebound at a higher clip. The thing that was particularly impressive of his game against the Lakers was his eight offensive rebounds, getting guys second chances. Like when you are able to do that, like that is something that brings a lot of value and offensive rebounds, second chances. That is a form of defense. It is preventing the team from getting the ball and taking it down to the other side of the court. It's keeping you on the offensive side. So, you know, if, if he is able to contribute those things more consistently and pair that with more disciplined shot blocking, I think the other thing as well is, you know, just he, he's, he's shown that, you know, he's, he's not the greatest as, as a big when it comes to switching. And then as far as when he plays drop, his instincts aren't always the greatest, in my opinion. Like when you are playing drop, when you are playing drop coverage, you have to be very stout. You have to be very aware of what the big is doing behind you, but you also have to make sure, you know, that whichever, whichever guard or whoever's carrying the ball at the top of the key, you have to make sure that they don't have too much of a window to be able to shoot it. And you also have to make sure it's not the wrong guy. Cause if you allow Damian Willard, Lillard enough of a window, we know damn well, he's going to hit that shot. Like, more than more than fifty percent of the time, and right? certainly easier said than done. I will say that. No, that it is. It is. It's very hard for a big to play. But but you're it is. I I I I probably used a bad <laughs> name, but you know, even let's even say a Peyton Pritchard, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. So any any shooter in the league. <laughs> yes. yes. But uh, so you know, I I, I think with Duran, you know, there's there's some there's some encouraging signs. Again, I, I think people are getting a little too definitive on him. And, you know, I, I, I will say, you know, I, I think, you know, we've, we've definitely been a lot more negative about him than we have been positive about him as the season starts. But, you know, again, it's just seeing, seeing how that trend continues to go. Another thing that I'm, I'm curious about is what does this look like when they do put in um, when they do put in a star Thompson, you know, like what, what, what does this team look like? And, you know, I think some of that is just how much of improvements he has made this off season, you know, what the jump shot looks like, what his handle looks like, how much he's actually able to, uh, you know, provide on the offensive end. I will say um, if, if his twin Amen Thompson is any indication, he could, he could be in for a really damn good second season. I'm not sure how much you've seen of Amen, by the way, uh, Troy, but Amen Thompson's looking really good. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so for me, like, you know, that this group is sitting at three and five, they're, you know, looking a, a lot better, uh, you know, a, a, on a lot of areas of the court, you know, still not perfect defensively, but I mean, through eight games, Troy, the Pistons and defensive rating are 15th in the league and they don't have, and they don't have arguably their best defender. Right. Right. So that makes you wonder could we potentially creep into the top 10 i don't want to go that far that quick but I want it makes it. you wonder what the ceiling of this group looks like yeah 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 especially because we know that's been a struggle for the past couple of seasons we like like we know the offensive struggle has been there but we have to admit i mean there has been some really excuse my language but piss poor defense from this team over the past couple of years <laughs> so to, to really see uh yeah to really see um the uh uh, improvements already so early on and then right missing your best defender you you have to be optimistic mm -hmm. and again i keep bringing it up the the day that ron holland and asar thompson share the court together for the first time good day. that's going to be fireworks i i i just that is a, a a underrated pairing that i don't think people around the league really care that much about but i think they have a chance to be pretty uh pretty disruptive mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. so uh, j just looking forward to seeing that, you know, just from that standpoint. So, so all in all, I mean, Troy, if we're, if we're being realistic, their next game is on the road against Charlotte. You know, I, I, those teams are relatively even. A lot of times the Pistons play in Charlotte. It's kind of a trap game. So we'll see what happens. But if they show up playing like they did against the Lakers, there's no reason they can't win that game. 
And then I believe their next game, I could be wrong. Uh, let me let me pull up their full schedule and double check. But I believe their next game is, oh, it is at home against Atlanta. So say that this team through 10 games is five and f- is is five and five Holy is shit. not far stretched. No. And I would argue four and six is is more than attainable. Absolutely. So if if we we looked at this slate and said, you know, if, if they can sit around there, they're in a good spot, and I would say they're right on track. Yeah, yeah, and something fun, you know, you pointed out real very early on in the podcast is two teams that we're ahead of, Philadelphia 76ers and the Milwaukee Bucks. And if you look at that yep. standing right now, eight games in, we're, we're a ninth seed. We're, you know, we're a play-in mm-hmm. team right now, which is pretty fun to see because we have not seen anything like that over the past few seasons. So Right, and, and you know, again, as, as more games are played, we'll see a lot more. We'll see a lot more separation, a lot more clarity of, of where teams really stand. You know, like it's the standings are, are are weird as heck right now because the the three worst teams in the league as of today, according to uh, according solely to their rankings, are the Utah Jazz, Philadelphia 76ers, and Milwaukee Bucks. Now, Troy, two of those teams are supposed to be championship contenders or at least according to their front offices they're supposed to be championship contenders now philly there's some extenuating circumstances i want to I, we'll, we'll get we'll get into them in a minute because i think it just comes down to players need to play but with the milwaukee bucks Giannis and and, and dame have largely been available Giannis missed you know missed a game against cleveland he, he's largely played this season. The only piece that's been missing for this group has been Chris Middleton, which don't get me wrong. Chris Middleton, big piece of their championship roster. And if they want to make any, you know, and any moves, you know, throughout the season, he's going to have to play a big role. But if we're being realistic about what Chris Middleton is in 2024 or, or, or more realistically, what Chris Middleton is not, it's not necessarily like he's going to come in and just unequivocally make this team better. And, you know, I know people are talking about, Oh, well, they should have made moves, you know, in the summer. And, you know, I've even, I even said that a little bit to you as well, but like when they made this damn trade, they are locked in as you can be. And I mean, Troy, if, if this gets slippery, and this just continues to keep going this direction. I mean, I, I don't want to like overreact here, but I think by the trade deadline, there's a realistic chance Giannis Antetokounmpo could be looking for a new home. Yeah, yeah. That I, I don't think that's too far fetched because look at there's already Vegas odds on it. When Vegas odds oh, are on it, it's oh, real. Yeah. yeah, isn't it like plus one fifty or something? Did I see that right on Twitter or something like like so? I mean, that's higher than you realize. But yeah, no, I I think this team has just struggled to play competitive basketball. And, you know, when you sent me that text a few days ago, Sean, of looking at, you know, what we're going to be talking about the podcast, looking at Milwaukee Bucks struggles. And even they 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 had it was their game to win last night against the undefeated Cleveland Cavaliers and they blew it at the end there. Uh, so I, I think they're, they're not playing with that competitive edge that I've seen in years prior, even yep. before they got Dame, it seemed like they were playing really competitive basketball and Giannis, no matter what would, and, and the roster they were putting out would always play competitive basketball. And even there were some stretches last year. I know last year, certainly even in the regular season, didn't meet the uh, potential of what this team could be, but there was even some games last year where where they showed some flashes that they were getting things together, but then it would just crumble later on. And yep. it just seems like we haven't seen any, like zero flashes that this team can be playing, you know, at the end of May and the beginning of June. Uh, I, I have not seen like one game this year where that would have been my assessment. So except maybe the yeah. first one, but even then you didn't have. You, you know, you did have Giannis, but that was against a very depleted roster of the 76ers anyway. So they're one win of the yeah. year. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm yet to have seen this team be good. And I was high on them this offseason. I really thought they were going to get everything together this year, and I have not seen a second of it. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing that's the most surprising to me is the fact that the chemistry between Giannis and Dame looks legitimately no different than it did last year. Right. And... 
And, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, I don't know if there's a specific person to blame on that. I will say Doc Rivers, it's not really looking great for him presently because the whole point of bringing in Doc Rivers was to turn the ship around, get Giannis and Dame to improve in their chemistry, get them playing more pick and roll, get this team into a more competitive standpoint. Adrian Griffin was 30 and 13 with this team, Troy. And I don't know what Doc Rivers record is off the top of my head. It's a hell of a lot worse than 30 and 13. He's he's well under 500 thus yeah. far as the head coach in the Milwaukee Bucks. They brought in Darvin Ham as, you know, as their assistant coach, you know, pretty much their defensive coordinator over the summer to try and help make this team better. That's done nothing. Uh and and according to according to Bovada, which is like, you know, one of the like one of the sports books, uh Miami Heat are currently at plus 150 to be the most likely team for a Giannis trade. It goes Miami at plus 150, Brooklyn at plus 210, Houston at plus 400, San Antonio at plus 600, and Memphis at plus 600. In my opinion, I think that Oklahoma City should be considered as well. I think I, I think teams like Utah would certainly have the assets, but I think that they're way too young. People are bringing up the Knicks as a potential <laughs> um, as, as a potential option, but they yeah. have certainly pushed in a lot of their chips as well. Right. I mean. The, and, but the other thing is, you know, too, is if you're Milwaukee, you probably want to trade Dame first. Oh, but yeah. Here's the, Absolutely. But, here's the, but here's the counter question, Troy. Who in their right mind at this present state is taking Damian Lillard as is for the money that he's owed? Yeah, our uh, our guest. Is high. Our classic guest ahead, is always the Knicks. I was going to say our classic guest is always the Knicks, but we we know that they're in a totally different uh, spot right now. So that was more of a joke. Yeah, they have Jalen Brunson, man. Exactly, uh, like, exactly. why would they do that? Exactly. Exactly. I don't even know. Like Miami was infatuated with him last summer. The whole the whole plan was get Dame to Miami. That's where he wanted to be. He said it publicly. If Miami was given the opportunity to get Damian Lillard right now. Would their trade package even be half as good as it was last year? Mm-hmm. And so. you know, again, this is this is coming from someone that is as big of a of a Damian Lillard supporter as 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 anyone comes, right? Like I I think Damian Lillard is one of the best you know guards that that this league has seen over the last decade. But if we're talking about the guy that has been there. You know, ever since his his time has started in Milwaukee, he's not been that guy. And there's still nights where he's shooting the basketball really well. There's still nights where you know, like he he like he he certainly can score the basketball, right? That is that is not an issue. But in other areas, especially defensively, they ju- they just don't have the personnel to hide the 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 uncomfortable truth that he is just too much of a liability and yeah. um you know i know that at the time you know this podcast included we were big fans of what the dame uh, trade could mean but man if you are if you are part of the milwaukee bucks and you are actively watching uh the way that um if if you are watching the way that um drew holiday has played mm. For the Boston Celtics and the way that he contributed for that title run, and how Boston is probably on pace to do it again, you gotta you you can't help but wonder if you're the ones that slammed your championship window right in your face. Right, right, and we we think we don't really think of at first glance how big a, losing a guy like Drew Holiday is, but when you know the game and you know what pushes teams over the hump to win championships the mm-hmm. the name that comes to mind is a drew holiday because he's done it you know with uh with boston just this, this past year and and that and, yep. and you're right you know we're looking at the future of next season and, and him probably doing it again but we have to just remind ourselves that this boston celtics team last season 2023 2024 would have looked a lot different without the drew without the drew holiday on their roster and especially looking at that 2023 um celtics you know who who didn't win in seven games who lost in game seven to miami 
it would have looked good to have had him in that series against Miami. Uh, so mm -hmm. re really Boston made that trade because they knew he could push them over the hump. And we know that yep. uh, he had the ability to push the Bucks themselves over the hump in 2021 when they did win the championship. So when you yep. look at a guy like him, yeah, you know, he's not a, a sexy, as sexy of a player as Damian Lillard, but he certainly is a high impact winning player. And he uh, I, yeah, I, I as know of, people were talking about that, Sean. I really do. Yeah. As of today, he certainly has to be viewed as more of an impact on winning a championship. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I, I got to talk to Jamel McMillan, the head coach of the Motor City Crews, son of Nate McMillan, um, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. That clip's on my Twitter. It's also on YouTube. Feel free to check it out. One of the, one of the questions I made sure to ask Jamel McMillan was, if you're like, let's say that, you know, as a coach, you're showing players footage of this is exactly what I am about as a coach. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what I want from a basketball player. If you could, I, I, I pretty much asked, if you could have five of any NBA player on a court at a given time, who would it be? Right away, Drew Holiday. Right away, without any hesitation. Talking about how much he's just a high character person, but also just how much he brings on a basketball court to a team to that type of dynamic and you know he he can score at a high clip he could not touch the basketball once and he's going to have the exact same impact on the game which is really high so um yeah I, I i like not to be like hindsight general managers here or anything but it's just really not it really just can't be overstated just how much this move has backfired on them and you know assuming that it's not going to turn around very much because again it would take a, a miracle for this at this point to really turn around. It, it's got to be looked at as just what are the all time failure? What if trades? Because yeah. again, uh, you know, some of it is, you know, like, like some guys, like sometimes it just doesn't work, but when it just comes down to like, it, it doesn't even look like they're trying to make it work is when it's pretty disconcerting because it's like, why again, why is Giannis not sending nearly as many screens screens as he could be? Why are why aren't they even running like more inverted pick and rolls where Dame is a screener, right? Like like why why are those guys just essentially taking the ball up the court, alternating? It's almost like it's almost like Trey Young and Dejounte Murray, except these guys are supposed to fit together, right? So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's something to certainly watch because I think. Um... As the season goes on, I think that's going to be exposed probably more, if I'm being honest with you. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, no, no question. Especially as, you know, especially as their, as their schedule continues to get tougher and tougher. Uh, the, the, the team on the, on the Western Conference side, who in my opinion is in a pretty similar spot, however, their record might not indicate it as of yet, is the Denver Nuggets. Now, mm -hmm. they're four and three. Uh, you know, when you have Jokic on your team, you're still going to have a top five, top 10 uh, offensive rating. However, um, the, the things that you, that you just look at as far as, you know, that are, that are deeply concerning about this team is just the lack of depth. Uh, they're not getting the contributions from their bench players that they need to, especially the young, you know, draft picks that they really bet on that they were going to be contributors for this team going forward. It's just not happening. And uh, another contract that is looking, you know, not great as well is Michael Porter Jr. He's someone that, you know, they've paid, you know, quite a bit of money to, you know, be that third player for this team to kind of be like that third star. And, you know, that's just something else that just hasn't materialized for whatever reason. And now, as if this team was already, like, wasn't already facing depth issues, Aaron Gordon is going to be out for the next three to four weeks. Yeah, yeah, and he's a big piece of that team. He really is. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so, Troy, when I when I watch them, I just can't help but but feel like I'm watching a shell of what they used to be. And, you know, obviously the salary cap is a difficult thing. When you win a championship, you have to make the decisions of who you pay, who, you, who stays, who goes. But, I mean, the, the thing that's just concerning to me is None of those decisions have been supplemented with, you know, guys that have filled those roles. Yeah, yeah. to quote the great late uh, Vince Lombardi, never underestimate the heart of a champion. But my goodness, there's been no heart in this team. 
And that's something that I really, really catch up on when I watch good, or I guess, contenders is where's their heart? Where's their heart on the defensive end, right? Where's their desire mm-hmm. on the offensive end to get, you know, good shots and, and score the ball at will. And uh, what made that 2023 championship so special, I think, is they, they had desire and they had heart on both sides of the court. And they had, you mentioned, you know, sometimes when today's salary world, you can't keep all the players that you love. You think about Bruce Brown and how much he impacted that t- team to win a championship. But something's just not clicking with this team anymore. Uh, it's not the same yep. team I remember from a year and a half ago in, in mid June. You know, beating the Miami Heat for, and, and winning that championship in five games. Yeah. So you know, with me, Sean, I, I want to even see. I, it doesn't seem like Jamal Murray and Jokic have the same chemistry as they once did either. And to me, that should be the most concerning because that's what that that's the heart and soul of that team is those two being able to play together. And I'm not saying it's time to look at trading Murray or anything like that, but it, it's certainly, you, you got to wonder what's going on in that locker room. What's going on in the off season. Are they not, are they not training on that putting in the work? I guess I don't really know what's, what's going yeah. on with them or what needs to be fixed. That's what I'm trying yeah, to think, figure out. Yeah. I think Jamal Murray in particular is just a regression that you just really have to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just ever since he, he dealt with some of those injury issues last season, I'm not sure what has happened, but he has not come back as the same player whatsoever. And, you know, listen, we saw him struggle, you know, pretty mightily in, you know, in Olympic basketball with Canada, you know, some of those struggles, unfortunately are transferring over to the court. He is dealing with a bit of a concussion issue right now, but when he was playing, I mean, he's, he's shooting 37% from the field. He's shooting 30% from three. And, you know, this is someone that, you know, the reason why this team was so lethal was because at their height in the playoffs, when he was firing on all cylinders, this is being talked about as one of the best pick and roll combinations of all time. Bingo. It was truly a pick your poison. And Jokic is a fantastic NBA player. He's still one of the top three, top five best players of the world, undisputed. But when you don't have much of anything beside you, and especially when you don't have someone that can alleviate that pressure, and hit those shots and you know reliably score the basketball there's only so much you can do and it feels like there's you know there, it feels like there's some friction between the front office and the coach feels like you know the coach is just watching more and more of these good players leave and not be supplemented or replaced and you know i just again like when you look at like milwaukee and in denver it, it just you can't help but look at the parallels of how similar these teams are about how both of these teams, we talked about those windows being open for a long time. And whether it's because of decision-making, whether it's because of injuries, a a multitude of different factors, those windows, Troy, to me, they're closed. Like, like Denver is not, in, in my opinion, you know, as of, as of November 5th, 2024, Assuming nothing changes, because again, this roster doesn't really have much flexibility to make changes. Their window's done. Yeah, especially when you look at that Western Conference, and you well, we obviously know what Minnesota can do. You know, you know, San Antonio is on the rise with Wimby. Oklahoma City, man, watch the hell out. They are the number one on that list. And they were the number one seed last year. They finished, they had a better record last year than the Nuggets, right? So, I mean, even the playoff mm-hmm. that, the, that the Nuggets had, you know, in that game seven against Minnesota, Denver had some rough regular season games too last season that uh, they didn't yep. look like them, their championship south. So the fact that the Thunder last year even had a better record um, than, the, uh, than the Nuggets, yeah, it's only going to continue. The, your window in the NBA – is very small and short to win that championship. Um, you got to capitalize. Yep. You you got to capitalize. Yeah. yeah. And in order for that window to be extended, you have to make the right decisions. And again, that's not an easy thing to do, mm-hmm. but they've clearly failed in that mission. And when you have, when you have players like Jokic and like Giannis, there's extra play, there's extra pressure because there's no reason you cannot build multiple title teams around them. 
Right. And I think and, in the NBA fandom world, there's not a lot of sympathy either. If you can't win a championship nope. with Jokic, if you can't win a championship with Giannis, not a lot of not a lot of pats on the backs of it's okay, buddy. You know? <laughs> yeah, not a lot of whole not a whole lot of are you okay's more are, more what the hells. Yes. You yes, know? Yes. And you know, again, the Thunder man. Troy, I just want you to take a quick guess. Okay. Okay. The, the 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 Oklahoma City Thunder are seven and zero. Thus far this season, what is their lowest margin of victory? I'm gonna guess twelve points. You are correct. It is twelve. Oh wow! Points. Good guess. The Thunder have not lost. Have not won a game by less than twelve points. Yeah. This incredible. season, all all wins have been convincing, and. It's not even like this team necessarily, you know, like thus far offensively is, you know, firing on all cylinders yet. But when you watch this team, their energy on the defensive side of the court, the the addition of an Alex Caruso, he just fits in like a glove day one. And they 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 still don't have a Isaiah Hartenstein on the court. Yeah. They still don't have all those picks. Or they still like they still haven't spent any of those picks. I mean, Troy because of what this season could look like, there is a legitimate reality where the Thunder both win the NBA championship and because of the fact that they own the pick of the Los Angeles Clippers, they could also win the lottery. And if the Oklahoma City Thunder add Cooper flag to what they have going on, what are we even doing here? Just keep, just give them the championship for the next like five, 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And with that too, Sean, uh, we can look at a lot of their moves the past five season and just say, bravo, right? They, they made smart choices. They thought about their future. They thought about the players that they had in house to develop, but also they went out and got players that they wanted. I mean, SGA, by the way, was not drafted by the Thunder. He was a Clipper for a hot second, right? But he was they, a part they, of that trade with all those picks. With all those picks. So, and we we see if NBA teams aren't learning that that you can expose teams for aging stars for picks. I don't know what else needs to happen because it is it is cut and clear that those trades are not smart for the team that's de dealing all those picks. Well, and, and and by the way, Troy, the Thunder are still the youngest team in the NBA. <laughs> so yeah. when you talk about you know just just the the window the potential, uh, the, the, the terrifying thing for the rest of the league is the Thunder haven't even scratched the surface <laughs> of what they can be. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just keep beating this drum until the cows go home. Chet Holmgren. Yeah. Now, he was so overlooked last season because of the, of, of the rookie season that Victor Wimanyama had. And don't get me wrong, Victor Wimanyama deserved Rookie of the Year. He was the best rookie last season. Mm -hmm. However, if you watch Chet Holmgren and don't see the potential for him to also be a top five, top 10 player in this league, then I don't know what sport we're watching because he's starting to look slowly more like Kevin Durant on the offensive side and he's already an elite rim protector and defender on the other side. I was going to say his scoring this season already. You can see the the improvements from last season already. Of mm -hmm. Comfortability. And we, you know, we talk about that with our Pistons of learning how to score in the league. I mean, he's past that. I mean, he, he knows how to score already. And uh, it's coming with ease at this point. And you, you talk about yep. Kevin Durant. I mean, we, we use a phrase with Kevin Durant called assassin. I see Chet Holmgren becoming an assassin one day. Oh, full blown mercenary, dude! Stone cold serial killer. The guy is is in, in in his feel for the game as well. There's a really good clip I like of you know Chet Holmgren went on Paul George's podcast, and one of the clips that circulated from the show was you know Chet was like you know one of the things I hate is hearing players say, "Well, that's not my game." It's like, no, mother, your game is what the game dictates, and if that's not Chet Holmgren to a T, I don't know what is. Because if you need him to go out and get 30 that night, okay. If you need him to just focus on, on shot blocking, okay. If you needed him to even guard a guard on the perimeter, okay. Like, whatever the game needs. And, you know, it's just, 
looking from top down. The, the, the thing that's scary is you can't double team anyone on, on the Thunder because who are you going to leave open? You're going to let Shea Gildas Alexander get a wide open shot? Absolutely not. Chet Holmgren? Mm-mm. Jalen Williams? Nope. Lou Dort? Cason Wallace? Aaron Wiggins? Alex Caruso? Isaiah Joe? Those are all guys who are more than reliable three-point shooters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. in summary, the league is <laughs> really, really no other way to put it. I, 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 I am just, I am as high on 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 the on the Oklahoma City Thunder as you can possibly be on a basketball team. So, Thunder Celtics early predictions. Are you ready to even make an early prediction this early? Yeah, I, I, I feel pretty comfortable that the, that the finals is going to be Thunder Celtics. I think that I think that there's some real uh, wiggle room for who could be that that second or third best team in each conference. I think the I think Cleveland, in my opinion, as if they keep playing how they're playing right now, they look like a better team to me than the Knicks. Granted, the Knicks still have to get healthy, have to get a lot of their pieces together, but I mean, the way the Cleveland's looking as well, I mean that 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 looks like a pretty good basketball team. So, uh, but as far as the finals goes, I just don't think there's a deeper team in each conference. In Boston and Oklahoma City, and uh, you know what what that matchup would look like today. I have no clue. That's the beauty of the NBA season. We have many months left. We have many games, and you know we have no clue what what these rosters will even look like by the end of the season. But I'm I'm pretty fairly confident that assuming health is on both of their sides, the Thunder and Celtics are going are going to be there in the end. It'll be exciting to watch. Yep. One last thing before we wrap up, Troy. Joel Embiid, per Sham Sharanio, has been suspended for three games following a, uh, a altercation with a columnist in a post-game locker room scrum. If, you are, uh, if you've not heard of this story, if you're not aware of, of what happened, um, Joel Embiid confronted a, uh, a reporter uh, in the locker room over an article that was written from him about Joel Embiid slamming his worth at work ethic, slamming his, you know, him as a player. And the part that, you know, really crossed the line in the public opinion, in my opinion, um, in Joel's opinion, is when he invoked the name of not only Joel Embiid's child, but his late brother. And um, when you there's just, you know, there's certain things, Troy, where, you know, there's just a line that you can't cross. Now, unfortunately, that also applies for a Joel Embiid as well. You know, it's really tough to, you know, keep your composure on that type of thing. The unfortunate reality is the league does have to step in when something like this happens. You do have to protect the media members. You do have to protect, you know, to a certain extent. But on the media side of things as well, there's just a certain line that you don't cross. Yeah, and yeah. there's just a certain level of respect that you maintain. So if you ever wonder why we just stick to basketball here, that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's absolutely a line. And I think of even, you know, what, what, in our generation, one of the biggest trash talkers is our piston, uh, Rashid Wallace. But he has said many mm-hmm. times in public interviews that he understands there's a line. And when he trash talks and when he and I know this is a different game of trash talking versus media, but when he trash talked, uh, never once would he ever bring anything personal. It was all basketball related, all basketball related. And I think the same has to be said about journalism. I think journalists have the right to trash talk, but it has to be about basketball. You can't cross any of that line. Yeah, you have you have the right to be critical. You have the right to, um, you know, to to be honest. And even, you can even say, listen, if a player stinks, you could say they stink. But, the you know, going at someone's character, going at someone, you know, inflicting family members, you know, get it going beyond the line that needs to be crossed is, is just not necessary. Now, the you know, the thing with the 76ers is, you know, now this is just three more games that they're going to be without Joel Embiid. And, you know, Troy, we're, we're coming up to the 10, 10 plus game mark. And we have not seen Paul George or Joel Embiid yet hit an NBA court. Now, apparently Paul George could be playing as soon as um, as soon as the day that this podcast drops, which would be on Wednesday. And, you know, Joel Embiid, it would probably be, you know, at some point, you know, assuming that he's healthy enough to within the next week and a half to two. But I mean, Troy, the, like the, the like you could talk all you want, you know, like the 76ers can talk all they want about, you know, it's about the playoffs now. It's not about the regular season. It's about the postseason. If you keep that attitude 
you might not even be in the postseason. Right. So right. that's, you know, to me, I, I just, the reason why I hate their approach is because it's about stringing together and using the season as an opportunity to improve so that by the time that the playoffs come around, you are playing your best basketball and you are ready to compete for a championship. How is this team going to be in a, in, in a position to compete for a championship if Joel Embiid and, and Paul George don't know how to play together because they've one of them's been off the court the entire season? Yeah, yeah. The answer is simple. It's not going to work. And uh, I, Sean, I tell you this summer, I, I, I was... I was looking forward to seeing how a Paul George addition was going to be on this roster, but it just seems like in Philly, how the organization is ran. They, they can never get a team together to put, to play full potential, you know, to, to reach their full potential as a team. And uh, I'm afraid to say this early already, but the way that this direction is heading is we're not going to see that full potential because of the issues you just described. Yep. And, you know, it's, and let's be honest, uh, we, we both have seen this Philadelphia 76ers team without Joel Embiid, without Paul George. And as much as we both like Tyrese Maxey as a player, as much as we like certain pieces like Kelly Oubre, Kayla Martin, like, like there's good, there's good individual pieces here, but without Joel Embiid and without Paul George, this is a remarkably bad basketball team. It is. And they are showing that this yeah. is. Without those guys, this is on par with the process 76ers, and I mean that. Right. So, but that even raises the question too of what if you get them back? What if what if you get them healthy? What if they do jive together? You don't have a deep team. You don't have a deep roster. Yep. And, and deep mm-hmm. rosters do help you win games in the playoffs and especially playoff series. So yeah, I'm I'm not happy if I'm a Philly fan right now, Sean. Yeah, no, and 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 that's and that's really where you know, that's really where this Joel Embiid thing comes in because it's just, it's just, it's symbolic of the unrest and the tension that is rising in Philly. And even before this, you had Joel Embiid coming out saying that he thought that the, that the criticism he was receiving and the talk of him not being healthy was bull and that he doesn't deserve it. He's done a lot for the city. The, 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 the unfortunate truth, especially when you play in a city like Philadelphia is fans do not care about anything you do if it doesn't end in a championship or a championship like run. And, and we have, we have seen a lot of great individual performances, accolades and things from Joel Embiid. It's never resulted in anything past the second round exit. And so how, how do you tell Philadelphia fans to keep caring when it keeps going like that? If, if you want my opinion, Troy, the, the Philadelphia 76ers to me feel like the NBA's equivalent of the Dallas Cowboys. You know, the Lakers are obviously, you know, fit that bill really well, too. But, you know, team, these are teams that, you know, promise to be competitive really year, like, like really competitive every year. They're one of the biggest brands in the sport. You know, they have a really rabid fan base. You know, there's you know, they have players that, you know, they feel are MVP caliber or can take them to that, you know, to that promised land. But it just never materializes. Yeah. And the reasons might not be the same every single year. They might be. Um, they might be in the same points of the year or the same things every year. But when you are, um, um, when you are in this situation where you just continually see yourself to fail and fail and fail at the same spot, the commonality is you. The commonality is the organization. Common denominator. Yep. And so, you know, I, I, I think if this doesn't work out, I think they deserve to do a real, I think they have to do a real deep dive and a soul search on them as on them as a, as as an organization because Troy I think if there's anything that that I feel pretty comfortable in saying as of today the process has been a massive failure it's been a disaster they haven't even gotten to the conference finals how could that even be a success mhm never got like, out of the second round like yes you got an NBA MVP out of that, out of, out of that process, you got, you got the ability to eventually trade for, for James Harden. You, it also made you a destination that got Paul George. How many moral victories can you take when you're not getting many, when you're not getting actual victories in the time of the year that it counts? (laughs) You you can't Sean. Exactly. So, 
uh, you know, I, I, you, you could bring in as many coaches. You can, you can bring in as many presidents of, of basketball operations. You're still the problem, man. So, Troy, this is why I love this league. Is is just the intrigue, the storylines, the story lines, way yeah. that things can flip on a dime, but also just you know, like these are really within margins of points where we're talking about teams and their, and their differences. But I think as the season goes on, we'll just we'll we'll start to get even more clarity. See, you know, see what what, what the what the true top dogs really are, and um and and we'll definitely start getting some really good basketball. So with that, Troy, thank you for being here. To those who are watching, thank you for, for listening and watching from Half Court. If you like this, subscribe to the channel. Thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you guys next time from Half Court. Be sure you're subscribed.